please welcome Charlie Kirk, founder and executive director, and Candace Owens, director of communications for Turning Point USA. This is so amazing. Thank you guys so much for coming out. And I hope we get to keep the energy up. I know it's 8 p.m., but we're feeling really energized. Well, Candace, you know, the last couple days have been interesting. Yeah. Uh, I think two days ago, our day started at 3.45 a.m. West Coast time. We did Fox and Friends together for the first time, which was really exciting. Um, went back to the hotel. Just had nothing to do. So we decided to run a couple miles, go do the Dennis Prager show, the Ben Shapiro show, go meet with a couple donors, then go film a documentary at UCLA, drive to Orange County through three hours of traffic, raise a little bit more money, do another TV interview, get three hours of sleep, and do it all over again. So that's, that's, what that's we're kind doing. of a typical day at Turning Point So if we've got USA. energy, you so. guys have got to have energy, let me tell you. It has been such a tremendous journey, and I think I'm, I'm so blessed. If somebody had told me when I uploaded my first video onto YouTube last July, um, early August actually, that I would be standing on the stage in front of so many um, people and being so welcomed, I would have thought that they were crazy. But the truth is, I, I had this fire burning in my belly, um, realizing I actually, I was sick during 2016. I was in bed, and I was watching the election cycle go on, and I just kept hearing the word racism, 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 sexism, sexism, sexism. And it started to look a lot to me like racism was being used as a theme to guarantee black votes. And it was no longer something that was actually a threat in our society. So I had this amazing idea, and I don't recommend it, to, to quit my job and start making YouTube videos. It worked out well for me. Um, but <laughs> I, I, I was amazed to see the response. My first video, which you guys may or may not have seen, was just me, it was a little satirical skit called Mom, Dad, I'm a Conservative. I didn't speak about my views. You did see it, that's great, thank you. I didn't speak too much about my views. I didn't, I didn't come out and, and say what I support or what I didn't support. I simply said I was a conservative. And I was immediately met with some of the most racist comments that I've ever received in my entire life. People calling me an Uncle Tom, a coon, you know, a bed wench, which I didn't even know what that was at the time, simply because I was a black conservative. And of course, for me and Charlie, when people call us names, it just inspires us to keep going. Keep fighting. That's how you know you're doing, you're doing your job. And now, um, I guess, it's really changed up. Well, so here's the story of how I met Candace Owens. By the way, this is my fifth Western Conservative Summit, which is interesting because that's like one-fifth of my life, okay? <laughs> I, I started coming here when I was 19 years old, um, believe it or not, and they were nice enough to have a platform. John Andrews back then and Senator Bill Armstrong, amazing hero for conservatism. This has always been, I say this, this is the best conservative event west of the Mississippi, if not the best conservative event of the year. I mean, the energy, the people, is absolutely terrific. What a wonderful platform. And for those of you that don't know, I started this organization, Turning Point USA, uh, when I was 18 years old. Similar to Candace, I kind of had an unusual path to this whole thing. My life before that, I wanted to go to the United States Military Academy at West Point. I didn't get in, and it was the best thing that never happened to me. Um, I love my country, I love freedom, and I was so disturbed about the direction our generation was heading because of the indoctrination in our schools, because of the misrepresentation of our history, and the lack of a conservative infrastructure on high school and college campuses. So I went to my parents and I said, uh, I'm gonna do this thing for six months, I'm not gonna go to college. That did not go well, I don't recommend doing it that way if you don't wanna go to college. But as I like to say, it's, uh, it's been a long six months. It's been six years now that we've been at this. We had our six year anniversary a couple days ago. We are now on 1,300 college and high school campuses across the country, uh, which is just amazing. We are gonna have over 1,000 young women leaders at our Young Women's Leadership Summit next week in Dallas. Those of you that are attending. We host the nation's largest annual gathering of young conservatives. We'll have over 5,000 young conservatives in Palm Beach. We already have Tucker Carlson confirmed and other huge names. And what's happening, and Candace and I have seen this firsthand, is that there is a movement happening on college campuses. And it's a movement for freedom, a movement away from political correctness to reject the Marxist ideas that have so terribly plagued our civilization over the last 100 years. So I met Candace. Um, at an event back in November, and Candace, fact check me if I'm wrong, 
I think I hired you four and a half minutes after I met you. I think it was three and a half minutes. Three and a half minutes. It was, it was very aggressive. He was like, you sit down, stay here. I'm going to get you a contract. I don't need you to, I need you to sign the contract and get it back to me. Right, I was like, sign, okay. right here. Docu okay. signed. It's okay. You never heard of it. Just right here. Just yeah, initial. just write your name. I just need you to, to move your finger. And, and the deal was done. And the rest, as we say, is, is history in the making. It's actually. history. And for those of you that follow kind of our path and our journey closely, it's been quite a seven or eight months. And Turning Point was on an amazing trajectory at the time, and now it's just gone exponential. Um, and I believe today, what I knew back then, Candace is unlike any other conservative voice that we've encountered. Um, and because she is, she's confident, Thank you guys. she's articulate, she's charismatic, she's fierce, she's funny, she's direct. And what she has done is she has successfully been able to go between the worlds of culture and politics, something that conservatives are not supposed to do. Now, let's, let's take a little blast from the past here, Candace, if this is okay. Everyone was so surprised about the Kanye West thing. I was surprised. In fact, am I allowed to say it? I probably shouldn't. When I first met Candace, <laughs> I was not exactly a pop culture aficionado. Oh, okay? wait. Let me, let me tell you. When, Here we go. Yeah, that's putting it lightly, okay? <laughs> when Charlie and I met, he had no idea. I said to him, actually, the first name I said to him is, that I have this feeling that it's going to be Kanye West that breaks out of this liberal matrix. And he said, is that the one married to Beyonce? <laughs> and I said, oh, my God, we have, we have a problem here. And, but since then, I will give him credit. I made him download a bunch of music, and Charlie then, oh, yeah, this Kanye guy's great. Like, yeah, he's really, you know, he's got good beats and everything. You know, really, <laughs> really into it now. It's a little more culture now, I'm, pr I'm proud to say. So, but, you know, Candace was in my ear from the minute I hired her. I'll never forget the dinner I had the night I hired her. Um, I was like, I probably should get to know the person I just hired. You know, probably a good thing. Um, and she was just getting in. She's like, Kanye West is going to be the one that's going to break through culture. Kanye West is going to be the one that's going to come out as a Trump supporter. I think we have a video of this. August of yeah. 2017. Let's play the video of Candace on our good friend the, uh, with Dave Rubin on the Rubin Report telling uh, the future. I know you admire Kanye West. Do you Love. think that Kanye will be speaking out for the truth anytime soon or has he been threatened into submission? Before you answer that question, I will tell you, although I can't tell everyone where we are right now, I do see Kanye often somewhere very near where we are oh right my gosh, now. That's all stop, I can say. Stop. So maybe I can work a little something oh there. Oh my gosh. I am I'm, I'm only a fan. People ask me, who are you a fan of? You know, I'm only a fan of Kanye West. And the interesting thing is, uh, popular Kanye quote is that if you're a fan of Kanye West, you're not really a fan of Kanye West. You're a fan of yourself and you believe that you, you can make it. And his whole brand, ah. yeah, his whole brand, and most people who don't like Kanye West don't follow his music. So he doesn't make, they just think he's an asshole and he's an arrogant asshole. And what he actually is preaching is holding on to your own ideas, holding on to you, the version that you are, the version that you were when you came into this world before, you know, school sort of stripped you down and made you think that you couldn't do it. What we're talking about, right? Low expectations for everyone, black, white, Spanish. That's what you learn in school. You got to go work for somebody. You got to do this in the SATs. You got to be interested in math, science. Maybe you're not good at that. Maybe you're only good at this. So, um, his, his whole brand is what I, I love. It's about just believing in yourself, like to the umpteenth degree, yeah. you know, uh, to the point of almost delusion, being stepping into <laughs> your own world and being in your own mind and not allowing people to taint that. Um, I don't even remember the question. I was well, well I think the Kanye question West. basically was, yeah. do you think he can kind of go all the way? Yeah. Like in terms of what you're talking about yeah. on the political level, like the, yeah. the stuff that you're really getting, yeah. you, so, you think he can get there? Because he kind of yeah, jumps in, he right? He does, he jumps yeah. in. And the problem with Kanye is, he gets misunderstood and he's not the most eloquent speaker, you know, he'll, 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 he'll rant and then he'll say one thing and go over here and people that don't follow him don't dig deep enough. Yeah. Um, but I mean, Kanye, what he could do for the black community, and he tried it, you know, he told them, I supported Donald Trump and look what happened. It's a mental disorder. He, he, <laughs> right, didn't he check into yeah, a thing yeah, like yeah. the next day? Yeah, like, people were like, he's high. he only said that because he has a mental disorder and he purposely, when he checked out, what did he do? He went straight to Trump Tower and did a photo op with Donald Trump to let people essentially know that wasn't a mental disorder. I said what I said and I meant it. You know, and it's because he's always been anti PC. People look back at that Taylor moment and don't realize what he was saying was true. You know, she didn't deserve the award. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's really people that follow music. It was it's outrageous that she won that award, but it was about, you know, um, pleasing a certain fan base, whatever it was. It was totally like, you know, hijacked. And he did it 
again, not the most eloquent guy, <laughs> yeah, right? You know what I mean? Yeah. Not, that doesn't really think through the way he does. He acts, and afterwards, like, okay, maybe I shouldn't have done it that way. But what he was saying was incredibly important. He's always been anti-PC. Yeah, it's funny. I, I don't even remember. I know that I remember that moment. I was watching it, but I didn't know a lot about who who they think should have won. It was Beyonce. Uh, single oh, it was ladies Beyonce. video. Right, right, right. And she won for like a fairy tale princess like dress up. It was. Right, so I didn't, I'm not. That's like not really my music. So I don't. Yeah. I didn't really care about that. But I remember watching and thinking, what a dick he was. But understanding it the way you're framing it. Yeah, because is... people don't follow music. So that's why I said it's very hard for people to understand Kanye West or to be fascinated by him or to understand that. I I first said, if you understand Kanye West, then you can understand the movement of Donald Trump. Like it's funny to me that people can't correlate that. It's very similar. It's just anti-political correctness. So she saw the future in a lot of ways. I did. I, I really did. And I think what the reason why I knew that it was going to be a perfect partnership between Charlie and I is because I understood how it was plausible that black people um, have been voting Democrat, that we just thought that we had to be Democrats because they were black, that we just assumed that liberals had our best interests at heart and that conservatives were racist because I used to think like that. I'm a pretty smart girl, but I actually believed all this stuff. And when I started coming up out of this uh, sleepy coma of liberalism, I said to myself, how did I get convinced? Who brainwashed me? How, who put these ideas into my head? And I was able to identify three really important verticals that the left has been tremendously successful at hijacking. The first vertical is family. They broke down black families, okay? If, if you ever want to make an entire community go amok, break down their families, right? They removed the black fathers from the home and then the black youth started getting into a lot of trouble. And, and what, who does the black youth turn to if they don't have mom and dad together to tell them what's right and what's wrong? They turn to culture. They turn to hip hop. They turn to media. They turn to music. They turn to Jay-Z. They turn to Kanye West. They turn to Beyonce to tell them who they should like. LeBron James to tell them who they should vote for. They, in many ways, become mom and dad. So I understood that culture was such an important vertical if we were going to start changing the conversation in the black community. And of course, the last vertical, the third one, is education. Black people are actively learning their history wrong in school. Public school system essentially just works to, it's, it's a propaganda system. It works to indoctrinate black youth against things that will ultimately help them. And I had an idea how I could, thank you. <laughs> I had an idea that if we could attack those three verticals, we could forever change America. We could forever change black America. We could get them to start focusing and understanding where we went wrong. We could get them to start understanding why it is that my grandfather, who, who grew up in the 1940s in a segregated South, did better than my father did, in, in, who was born in the 1960s. We could help them understand what actually went wrong. And I'll tell you, it's not white people, it's not racism, it's government dependence. And so we embarked on this amazing journey. So I got a call from Candace Owens two days after we did an amazing event at UCLA. Uh, by the way, Candace and I are the first duo of conservative speakers to speak at UCLA, UC Berkeley, and Stanford in one semester. And not and, die. And live to tell about it. <laughs> survivors, the ultimate survivors. The ultimate survivor. And so. Candace beautifully handled the Black Lives Matter protester from UCLA. Um, someone who thought they were oppressed, but they did also go to UCLA, so that's a little bit of a little bit of a tough argument to make. Look, if you go to UCLA, I love this, I love this Harvard black only graduation ceremony. Self-imposed segregation. I mean it's, it's unbelievable. And, and look, it might not be politically correct. If you go to Harvard and you're black, you're not oppressed. I mean, just give me a break. I mean, seriously, you're like the luckiest person in the world. Nevertheless, Candace and I spoke at UCLA. We had a couple clips that started to go viral, one on Friday night. So I get a phone call very early Saturday morning from Candace, and she's in tears. Like, Candace, what's wrong? And she says, Kanye West just tweeted about me. So, hold on, that's the one that, oh, Kim Kardashian, okay, she's married to Kim Kardashian, got it, okay. Got it. okay. Uh, what? What do you mean tweeted about you? He hasn't tweeted in like 18 months. And she's like, no, you don't understand. He tweeted, quote, I love the way Candace Owens thinks. And it's like, I, 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 what? You know? <laughs> and, and so, as they say, the hurricane started 
just about at that moment. It really did, and I, I did cry. I, it was really embarrassing. Um, but I cried not, not because he was a celebrity, not because he was Kanye West, not because I felt that I essentially spoke it into existence, but because I understood what had just happened immediately. I understood the firestorm we were going to be at. I understood that we had just cracked culture. And the left has had a stranglehold on culture. They've had a stranglehold on Hollywood. There's an underground ecosystem of conservatives in Hollywood who are afraid to speak up for fear of losing their jobs and their livelihood. Right. And Kanye West boldly tweets... I love the way Candace Owens thinks, followed by the next day, a series of tweets of him wearing a MAGA hat and saying that the mob can't make him not love Donald Trump. Okay? <laughs> what Kanye West did cannot be understated. And, and I go around and I speak to people and they say, oh, we shouldn't be worshiping celebrities. And it gets me, it infuriates me. It infuriates me because you have to understand. Kanye West just gave permission to every black person in America to think independently and to think differently. That's what he did. That's exactly right. And so, so then Candace gets contacted by Team Yeezy and uh, <laughs> this whole kind of movement continued. I think we have a picture of this amazing day in history that, <laughs> that I was my somehow, birthday, by the way. I somehow was involved Best in. Best birthday I'll, ever. I'll tell you the funny story. The picture will be coming up. There it is right here. Um, Charlie's thinking, is this the one married to yeah, Beyonce? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I knew by then. Candace was nice enough to include me in the meeting. Now, people understood people. I call them the, the blue check mob, you know, the conservative pundits and journalists. Um, they, uh, they understood why Candace was there. They're like, what the heck is Charlie <laughs> Kirk doing meeting Kanye West? So that was fun. Um, but that, was, that, that moment was so defining because Candace and Kanye hit it off immediately. And they found out that they had so much in common to want to improve the black community. And we also, have, we also found out that we have many things that we don't have in common. And we celebrate the fact that we don't have to agree on everything. And that's what it's about. It's about destroying a monolith. It's about encouraging black people to think independently and to look at policies and to talk about things that will actually help them and to remove emotion from the equation. You know, when we hit these college campuses, that's what I tell them. Somebody has successfully hijacked your emotion. No matter what you are going through, in a moment of pain, Someone can manipulate you if you allow them to. In a moment of pain and frustration, when you watch a video of, of a black person that's unarmed, like Philando Castile was, which was horrifying to watch, I can't find a single conservative thinker who would say that was okay, you know? It, it, it pains everyone to watch this man who is reaching for his wallet get shot and killed by a police officer, right? But then you allow someone to tell you that that happens every day. You allow someone to tell you that this is real and that black people now have to fight against police officers and that's where things go wrong. That's what I talk to them about on campus is taking ownership of their emotions, checking your emotions with facts, making sure when you are going to launch a battle against somebody that they're actually your enemy because the truth is police officers save black lives. So I, I would say that this semester, it, it's always been um, an uphill battle. Ca Charlie and I go onto these campuses and we've got these Black Lives Matter protesters. We've got Antifa with their cool scarves. I don't know what they're doing. They're such courageous folks that we can't see their face. Right. Like, that's it, a real, it's a great existence. We have folks that are standing up playing music and shouting down. And then this amazing thing happened because we started to see that the dialogue started to shift that people were starting to listen and to lean in and to start to understand that what we're saying is, is to we're trying to help you. We're trying to tell you that there is no value in being a victim and there is only value in being a victor and that every single person in the world goes through pain and hurt. You're not, you're not special. Every single person here has gone through something. And, and so what, what we're about to show you is really powerful stuff. And Candace can now show evidence of the black defection from the Democrat Party happening on the very grassroots level. And so her ability, her capacity to communicate, her language has now been inserted. Kanye West used her language, get off the plantation in one of his rap battle songs against T.I. And this idea of getting off the Democrat plantation is so important. And as, as we always say, no community has been harmed more by Democrat policies or politicians than black America. Yet they keep on voting for those same policies and politicians. If you, you show me an American ghetto, I'll show you where a Democrat's in control. Oakland, Philadelphia, Chicago, Baltimore. Detroit. Every, I mean, everywhere. The most Baltimore, murderous, Philadelphia. most broken cities yeah. are run by Democrats. That's so exactly this clip right. right here happened just 14 days ago at Stanford University, um, and it is so powerful it goes beyond words. So let's play the next clip. I love this video. Clip. 
But I'm just saying, I've been researching Black Lives Matter and I've been understanding the politics and how they're funded by white liberals. And recently, I've been feeling like they're white liberals in blackface because right. they're, they're, they're white liberals in blackface. What I say that is because the white liberals is all about feminism, LGBT. White liberals don't really care about black people. That's I correct. realize white liberals don't really care about me, bro. That's correct. I'm off the plantation, bro. I'm off the plantation, bro. I escaped the plantation, bro. I'm empowered. They don't want me to have power. They want to keep me dependent. But I'm realizing like this. They put white no, liberal like ideas, LGBT, women, non-binary, white feminism, all that Hillary Clinton stuff, put it in blackface. Because if we say it, it's going to be too crazy. Yeah. So then Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, it started by three lesbian women. It started by three lesbian women. It's not really supporting black families. My question is, what do you think that has to say about the movement that they don't mention anything about but black cool fathers I'll tell on the you, website? I'll tell you what it means. Right? Nothing so about off, black fathers. First off, first off, if I can just say, woo, another one off the plantation. They got, a, they got a problem, and this is how it starts, right? So this is how it starts. So what he said in the beginning was really interesting, because he said, originally, I, I liked Black Lives Matter. Me too. Why would I be opposed to that? Um, black Lives Matter, right? Of course they matter. So you have to understand something about the left. They are incredibly good when it comes to linguistics. They use euphemisms, right? Planned Parenthood. Of course I want parenthood to be planned. Oh, by the way, we're actually killing 800 black babies every <laughs> single day. Eeks, you know? So this is what they do. They manipulate you by using a term that no person in their right mind would be against, right? Who would be against Planned Parenthood? Who, who would be against black lives mattering? But the truth is when you do a deep dive and you start to look at the finances, you're exactly right. The people that are in control, black lives matter is a political arm of the Democratic Party. Call them what they are. And, the, and, and their idea is to keep black people, as you just mentioned, enslaved and dependent via their emotion and their anger, right? So what I would say to you first off is to encourage you to keep going and to keep doing a deep dive because that's how it started for me. Right? It was one thing that didn't make sense. It was this constant narrative being shoved down my throat. But when I deep dived on these organizations and looked at who was funding them, it never really lined up to, to the things that would make the black community better. You mentioned that they wanted re that you realize that they don't promote straight black men, right? They never talk about the things that matter, black fathers in their home. That's because they don't want black fathers in the home. Make Bingo. no mistake. So congratulations to you. Keep digging. And can somebody at Turning Point USA get his uh, stuff so we can, we can hire him? Right. Opportunity. Thank you so much. Welcome to the revolution. Never one to miss an opportunity. I was like, let's. How get great this is guy that, right? It's, it, it was a really thank you. It was a really wonderful, beautiful moment, and and to see this shift taking place on campuses, to see it taking place of all places, Stanford University, and they're starting to think and they're starting to research because this is what we're talking about. If Black Lives Matter, why aren't we talking about Black fathers? Why aren't we talking about the single motherhood rate in the Black community, which has jumped from 25 percent to 73 up up to 73 percent in the Black community? Why aren't we talking about the fact that when you remove fathers from the home, your kid is is worse off in life? You're 20 times more likely to end up in prison. Why aren't we talking about the fact that you know you're nine times more likely to drop out of high school they don't talk about any of those issues because they don't care they really are just a political arm of the democratic party and by doing these videos by capturing these moments and talking about the facts even the people that disagree with me in the black community because they feel that they, they want to disagree with me they'll go look up the facts and they'll find out that i'm actually telling the truth you know why how is it plausible that black lives matter is not outside boycotting planned parenthood i don't understand Eight hundred black babies every single day, and you're out here boycotting police officers because sixteen, one six, sixteen unarmed black men are killed accidentally by police officers. That's what you're boycotting. So it's it's about giving them the facts. Because the truth is, the black community has never even been presented with this side of the argument. That is what the the liberal indoctrination system does. They only show them one side, and they believe that they're right. When you when you give them logic and when you give them facts, they're incredibly reasoned, and they're able to go research and we start to see this sort of beautiful transformation take place everywhere every day and so 95 percent of black people vote for democrats nationwide despite what we said their policies and their politicians continually keeping them downtrodden and poor and dependent now it's very interesting 
when you have 95% of people voting a certain way, that political party doesn't have to compete or earn your vote anymore. So they just take it for granted. That's why these communities continue to go into ruin. And so make, if you want one piece of evidence to show a liberal in your life, I'm sure there's some liberals in this audience somewhere. God bless you. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll pray for you as we say. Um, if you want one piece of evidence, you look at the State of the Union by Donald Trump. By the way, is our president not doing an unbelievable job? Can we just say that? Against all odds. Against all odds. We'll, we'll, we'll get there in a second. You look at the State of the Union where he says we have record low black unemployment. And you would think that the Congressional Black Caucus would be just up in arms and cheering. And they sat emotionless because they know. What do they know, Candace? Well, let's talk about the fact that they actually stood up and applauded when Obama announced more food stamps. Right? So th this is the problem. People mistake and they think that because you have a black person in office, because you have a black politician, that somehow correlates to black progress, and it does not. Okay? Melanin in your skin does not dictate what your interests are. And in fact, in fact, you look at Maxine Waters. Don't even get me started. By the way. We don't have enough time for that. By the way. She's a low IQ individual, she is. folks. I mean, she, she's I mean, an unbelievably low but IQ. But she lives, by the way, maybe she's a high IQ one because she lives in a six million dollar home Out outside of her, of her district. Outside of her district. Right, and, and and she gets paid to keep the racism narrative alive. That's her full time job. How many times can you say racism every time you step to a podium? Is Maxine Waters' full time job? Is it true or false? 100% true. And, and that's the problem, is that these, these black politicians have had their pockets lined to keep black people dependent. That is just the truth. The truth is that when there were less black politicians in office, black people were doing better in America when there was only 1,500. Today we have over 10,000 black politicians in office, and we had a black president for two terms, and the black community is worse off. Explain to me how. Well, and so here's the opportunity is that the left, as they always do, they way overplay their hand. And they are, they're failing to recognize the progress that this president has made for black America and for urban America. This president has done more in 18 months for black America than Obama did for eight years. Make no mistake. That is correct. And the, Candace and I had an amazing opportunity to sit down in the Oval Office with the president. And we are fierce and dedicated supporters of him and his agenda. And I really believe this. I believe that if his opponent would have won, oh my goodness. This We'd be done. America Western would be civilization over. would be wiped out. So th I, I believe it was a God thing. I really believe that God, I really believe that God, I really believe that. Only, only in a room full of conservatives does God get applauded. If we, if we were in a room full of Democrats, he'd be booed. He'd be right? booed. <laughs> it's just unbelievable. That's right. So of all the lines I say on campus, the one that for whatever reason I get somewhat of the most opposition, I say, God is real. How could you believe that? That's the worst thing. That well, because the, we talk about this all the time, Tribe. What the left has done is, is they have wanted people to believe that the government was God, that the government could fix all of their problems, that it, it wasn't family, that it wasn't religion, that it wasn't caring about your children, that it was the government and a policy that was going to help, you know, people succeed. In, in many ways, we, Charlie and I firmly believe that the left has tried to create the idea that the government is God in America, and they exactly are not. Exactly right. It's the deification of the state. And that's what Mao did, that's what Stalin did, that's what Pol Pot did. It's the classic Marxist playbook, is that if you eliminate the Judeo-Christian construct, you eliminate the capacity for the individual to make choices, and then you get rid of the church, you get rid of private philanthropy, you get rid of charity, and then you get rid of the moral order and code, people will still have that search for meaning. They'll still have that search for purpose. And what replaces that so nicely and neatly? The state and the ruler. And I believe there's no greater evil than trying to make yourself God than trying to make the individual a god over another person. That is correct. But as we like to say, uh, it's, it's time for a turning point. It's hey, time for a turning that point. That sounds like an interesting thing. So we're, we're on these campuses. How, we have any turning point activists out there? I, we see a couple. We love you guys. Yeah. Doing amazing, amazing work. These are the grassroots warriors on the front lines. Uh, NPR did an hour-long special on one of our fights and actually did a pretty good job, even by NPR standards. It was very, very fair. Um, it's, it, to, to get fair press, the best piece is written about us 
BBC and the London Times. I mean, it's like it's absolutely incredible. The media is coming after our movement, coming after us. And they are enemies. Way. Make no mistake. We are up against the media. It is the media versus the people That's versus right. the American people. Um, and, and, but look, we're willing to take on that battle. And, uh, and if there's one thing that I could say to you guys is to understand um, what these students in the background are screaming, what they are actually going through on campus, it, it cannot be overstated. I mean, I didn't, I didn't fully understand it until Charlie brought me and I actually saw that you have children that believe in communism, that believe in socialism, and that truly, in the bottom of their souls, hate America. That is what they are teaching on college campuses. And if there's, if, one, if there's one fight that you're going to jump into for the future, it has to be for schools, for, for, for changing this on-campus dialogue, for getting conservative thinkers to present the ideas. Because the demonization of America is happening in our, on our college campuses. And, and lower than that, not just college, high school, middle school, kindergarten. They're being taught that America is evil and that we are oppressors. And that's terrifying to me. And make no mistake, America is the greatest country in the history of the world. 100%. Make no mistake. We are, we are the luckiest people ever to live, to live at this time in this country. We are 5% of the world's population, yet we represent over 80% of the economic activity. We are the most benevolent country. We give away over 5 hundred billion dollars voluntarily to charity last year. That's the GDP of Hungary, Bulgaria, Belgium, Spain, and Switzerland combined that we voluntarily gave away on top of our U.S. tax dollar payment. America is the only country in the history of the world to voluntarily send our own troops and our own service people to go die for the rights and the freedoms of others. Look no further than the Korean War. Could you point to any other country that would send 50,000 of their own men to go die for the freedom and the creation of another sovereign country? Never existed in the history of the world. South Korea exists today because of the blood, sweat, soil, and sacrifice of American servicemen and military. Yes, thank you. And a, a round of applause for America, right? And, and make no mistake that, that we are fighting a, a cultural war right now. This is, this is a cultural war. We descend on these campuses and students are wearing USA shirts and students are chanting USA. They are told that that is a racist chant. USA, I kid you not, they say that is a racist chant, that that is a sexist chant, that that is a chant of oppression. And we, we cannot stress enough to you that every single day Charlie and I wake up and we're inspired and that schedule, that's us every single day. I mean, we flew in today, it's- Every day. Every single day we're on a plane. We love it. But, but we love it because we do feel in many ways that, that we are fighting a war and, and we are the soldiers and the generals and we couldn't do it without you guys supporting us. But understand that it's not enough to sit here and be idle and listen to ideas. You have to get involved in any way you can in a war. Whether you're a person, thank you. And you, have, you have the fighters, you have the writers, you have the financiers. That's the only way we are going to win. And right now, we are, we are on the brink of losing Western civilization. This is the last stand for Western civilization. That's right. And, and the, the ideas that are being taught in our universities and in our high schools are a direct threat to the future of our country. And look no further than the political success of Bernie Sanders. It would have been absolutely unconscionable that an outward socialist would get millions and millions of votes in the Democrat primary. In fact, he actually won the nomination if Hillary Clinton wouldn't have stole it from him. It's, just an, un, it's, an, it's an unbelievable thing to think about, that Marxism has now become mainstream, that hating America has now become popularized by Hollywood, by media, and by the educational elites. And so there has to be a defining moment, and I believe firmly now, we are the boots on the ground, and yet we look up and we say, wow, we have a president that is willing to fight for this country and what we believe in. And that is something that I think we've had in a very, very long time. You look at the failures of Bush, look at the failures of Clinton. It was just kind of the same globalist narrative and the retreat from American exceptionalism. And so this is a defining moment. The Democrats are going all in. They're going all in in 2018. And, and look, it's, it's going to be a defining moment for you because what the left will try to do next, and we've seen this happen just between Char Charlie and I, is, is to divide us, right? Um, these reporters are relentless. They, they are digging into and threatening my family. They're fr uh, threatening my friends. They're digging into my high school background and, and calling around and asking people questions like, has Candace ever dated a black guy? That's a real question that somebody got that, I, uh, that contacted me from high school, right? So the idea is that they, they see Charlie and I as a tremendous threat um, and, and they're not and going they to should. stop coming. Yeah, and they should, yeah, that's fair. <laughs>
Um, but but remember that. Remember that as, as people try to sway your opinion about, about not just us, everybody. Dennis Prager, you know, he, he he's fighting a war. I love Dennis Prager. Prager University, our great love partners. Dennis. Remember that at the end of the day, um, they only win if we're divided and that we all have to, to really come together in this moment for the sake of America and for the sake of Western civilization. So in closing, folks, please continue to support this amazing conference, the Western Conservative Summit. Jeff Hunt's a good buddy. He's just working his tail off. We love him to death. And the Centennial Institute and the Colorado Christian University and this state is one. This, this can go either way. Um, you know, I, I'd hate to see this become a blue state. It's always been known as a purple state. But uh, the left's forces are out in full here in this state. But we're really at that defining cultural battle where we can go one of two ways. We can either recommit to our founding values of free enterprise, individual liberty, and respect for Western civilization, or we can go a completely different direction, one that deteriorates the individual, one that destroys the Judeo-Christian ethic, one that absolutely eliminates the private property, private property rights and you name it, and turns America into a society of victims and not victors. And I always ask people the question, would you rather have America look like California or Texas? And I think I know how the room would answer to the question. Yeah. So, so we're just getting started. We have our Young Women's Leadership Summit, our Young Latino Leadership Summit, our High School Leadership Summit, our Chapter Leadership Summit. We're adding 50 staff this summer. We've got our Young Black Leadership Summit. We're doing 35 campus stops for the midterms in all key states. Our haters better have a lot of stamina we because we really are just getting started. Because if you think you're going to outwork Candace Owens and Charlie Kirk, you're wrong because we're going to win and they're going to lose. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. <laughs>